Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's event, a commemoration of the 11th anniversary of Libya's February 17th uh, revolution. We congratulate the Libyan people on the 11th anniversary of the February 17th revolution, and we pray for Libya's uh, continued progress towards stability and successful uh, state building. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to uh, take a moment and thank our uh, keynote speaker, Ambassador Norlin, our uh, panel of experts and our moderator who have graciously accepted the invitation uh, to speak uh, today. And on behalf of everyone at the Libyan American Alliance, uh, including our Executive Director Munji Duwadi, Chief of Operations Omar Tabouni, Research Director Natasha Herchowitz, and uh, our Legal Director Kyle Sumanen, as well as our attorney, Faisal Gill, I uh, welcome all of you. Uh, a warm welcome to our audience joining us as well. My name is uh, Dr. Isam Omesh. I'm the president of the Libyan American Alliance, a Washington DC based nonprofit, nonpartisan group dedicated to advocating for the rule of law, democracy and human rights in Libya. To that end, we have been engaged in multiple uh, projects uh, where we worked with our congressional uh, partners on the Hill to draft and pass the Libya Stabilization Act in the House, and we hope to move it along in the Senate where it's up for markup. We have done uh, nationwide projects that matter to the Libyan American uh, community where we've addressed issues like the no ban and, and other national uh, activities that impacts Libyan Americans. We have been working on engaging uh, um, the Libyan American community uh, in projects where they are empowered to engage uh, their uh, officials so that they can help uh, develop credible a voice in shaping US policy in Libya. Uh, we have been involved in policy advocacy uh, where we have spearheaded uh, certain uh, topics in Libya, uh, important to Libya's future. And we have engaged experts and, and engaged policymakers in that regard. And we've also assisted the victims of human rights abuses in Libya to take up legal action uh, in US courts against war criminals and dual US uh, Libya citizens who have committed egregious crimes. So please look us up, look us at web, our website and engage us as we uh, continue to do these activities. Once again, thank you all for joining the Libyan American Alliance's conversation with Speaker Ambassador uh, Kia Richard Norland, uh, also the US Special Envoy to Libya and our panel of experts. The way we're gonna do this is we're gonna have a moderator, Dr. Bill Lawrence, who will engage uh, the experts once we hear the keynote uh, uh, comments from uh, our ambassador. Uh, we have, uh, you know, Bill Lawrence is uh, an expert in North Africa and somebody who's engaged uh, that topic in numerous occasions. He has worked as a diplomat and as, as an academic in this matter, uh, where he was the North Africa uh, director at the International Crisis Group. He was a non-resident fellow at the Middle East Institute uh, he was a former diplomat, as I said, who worked in the Libya desk and in the Libyan embassy uh, in Libya. And he's currently a professor at American University. With us also is a group of uh, experts, uh, including Dr. Karim Mezran, who's the Atlantic Council resident fellow, uh, uh, Mr. Ben Fishman, the senior fellow at the Washington Institute for New East Policy, Mr. Hafid Lagwell, senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Lamis bin Saad, who is a member of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum and an assistant professor at the University of Tripoli. Um, we are waiting for, uh, I believe, Hala, but she may have come in as well. Hala Bougagiz, who is a um, uh, co-founder of Libyan think tank, Jusur Center, as well as Mr. Ali Abu Zakouk, uh, former uh, minister uh, in Libya for a parliamentarian and the president of the Citizens Forum for Democracy and Human Development. And now uh, I'd like to introduce our ambassador, uh, Ambassador Norland, who is confirmed to be Libya's ambassador on August 1st of 2019. Uh, he was also appointed as the US Special Envoy for Libya uh, in May of 2021, uh, a career uh, diplomat and a, a foreign uh, service uh, uh, diplomat with an impressive array of uh, service. Uh, he was a, a policy advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, Chiefs of Staff in the past, served as an ambassador in multiple countries, including Georgia and as Uzbekistan and other uh, uh, missions. Uh, he's also somebody who's uh, put heart and soul in the Libyan matter. 
for which we are very grateful uh, for his uh, patriotism and service. And certainly the Libyan people are very grateful for his uh, stewardship and his involvement. We hope to hear about U.S. policy in Libya, uh, certainly 11 years after February, uh, you know, the February 17th revolution, hoping to see signs of hope and, and uh, pathways for stability and prosperity. Uh, without further ado, Ambassador Norland, thank you very much for being with us. Hey, thanks, Esalman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Well, great. Anyway. Okay. No, it's great to see you again, and, and I really appreciate this invitation, and uh, and I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, from uh, some of the other panelists as well and get a variety of perspectives on what's going on. I, I think this is a really welcome opportunity to put in perspective the past uh, decade or more in Libya's tumultuous history. Um, let's start by remembering that Libya is a young country coming out of the colonial period only in the early 1950s. We also have to recall that Libya bears the scars of over 40 years of brutal dictatorship which left the country isolated from the West and its citizens fearful of political expression and involvement. Gaddafi's excesses led to NATO military intervention to protect civilian lives with the unintended consequence of toppling the government and opening up a period of intense turmoil. Militias filled the security vacuum and continue to play an outsized role to this day. External actors also sought to play out their interests on Libyan soil. Extremists seized on the vacuum that was created and the country was racked by pitch battles against efforts by ISIS to use it as a platform for the expansion of its perverse caliphate. The traditional regional divisions and rivalries between East, West and South were exacerbated with some areas and ethnic groups feeling more marginalized and disadvantaged than ever. <clears throat> So Libya became a battleground for civil war and for the war against terrorism. Terrorists continue to seek a foothold in Libya, and we must remain vigilant in our efforts to prevent this. But as recently as 2019, there were still those who believed the country could only be reunited and stabilized at the point of a gun. A precarious military balance eventually took hold, which ultimately allowed the UN-led political process to begin the, uh, to put the country back on the path to peace and stability. Dedicated public servants like Hassan Salame and Stephanie Williams harnessed international support for the Berlin process launched by Chancellor Angela Merkel and provided a framework on which Libyans themselves could rebuild their country, their country. That framework comprised political, military, and economic tracks facilitated by the UNSMIL mission. Military leaders from each side in the so-called 5 plus 5 Joint Military Commission surprised the world with the announcement of a ceasefire in October 2020. Economic progress was reflected in the ending of the oil blockade and the first steps towards transparency in distribution of Libya's oil wealth nationwide and towards reunification of the central bank. On the political front, this was followed by the Libyan political dialogues uh, forums success in producing an interim government, which took office in March of last year, tasked with paving the way to elections in December. Everything hinged, however, as we all know, on those elections. These were the key to unifying the country and regaining its sovereignty by empowering and legitimizing a strong central government comprising executive and legislative leaders elected by the people. There was nearly, univer nearly universal disappointment that these elections were postponed and confusion about what comes next. Now, there were multiple reasons for the postponement, but it was not because of any lack of technical preparation. The High National Election Commission, led by Dr. Imad al Sayed, did a remarkable job in organizing the infrastructure for a proper vote. Nor was the lack of a solid legal or constitutional basis the principal factor in the postponement. To be sure, the electoral laws were procedurally flawed, but viable candidates were being registered and there was no legal reason the elections could not take place on time. In retrospect, it seems to us the issue of controversial candidates, it was the issue of controversial candidates that brought things to a halt, and especially the late emerging candidacy of Saif al-Islam Qaddafi. Of course, there were already concerns that 
Uh, one candidate was a former military officer who had launched an offensive on Tripoli, or that another was someone who had pledged not to run. But in some ways, <clears throat> those candidates balanced each other off in the public eye. Now, to be clear, one solution would have been for the candidates themselves to recognize that their personal aspirations would lead to division rather than unity and bow out of the race for the well-being of their country. But seeing as the candidates were not going to bow out, another approach would have been for all three controversial candidates to run and possibly to lose in free and fair elections. What better message for problematic candidates than to be rejected by the voters themselves? However, it quickly became apparent that a Gaddafi candidacy was different. It raised in many people's eyes the specter that the Libyan revolution had been for nothing. Whether he had a chance to win or not, just having the name on the ballot of the man who demanded in January 2011 that revolutionaries be attacked and destroyed and that loyalists, quote, bleed them day and night was simply too much for many people. Indeed, one might wonder whether those promoting his candidacy had in mind exactly that impact. And let's remember, there are reports that the Wagner Group had facilitated Saif's reappearance. Under pressure, the system for reviewing, appealing, and approving candidacies, largely in the hands of the judiciary, broke down. People were afraid, and not without reason, that elections would lead to violence and that the results would not be accepted by all parts of the nation. Ultimately, of course, it is Libyans alone who should decide who can be on the ballot and who should win. But two important facts stood out following the postponement of the elections. First, nearly three million Libyans had registered to vote and were still eager to cast their ballots. Second, not a single politician or leader wanted to be identified with or held responsible for postponing the elections. Even days before December 24th, no formal postponement was announced. This is still the overriding dynamic today. The pressure is still on to produce a credible timeline for elections as soon as possible. Even those who see elections as political suicide know they cannot be seen as standing in the way of the people. Following her reappointment as lead UN facilitator, Stephanie Williams has engaged with the full range of actors across the Libyan political spectrum, pressing institutions such as the High State Council and the House of Representatives to finally reach a consensus on a way forward. That process is ongoing. On February 10th, the HOR adopted a roadmap toward elections in consultation with the High State Council. The HOR also proposed a new prime minister to lead the country toward these negotiations. These steps are still the subject of ongoing negotiations among the parties. We support efforts to chart a new political path forward based on consensus and proper parliamentary procedure. We're doing everything we can to assist Stephanie Williams and all the leaders involved to reach agreement on how to make these efforts successful. The United States joins the UN and other international partners in rejecting any effort to stoke violence in this context. We call on all parties to focus exclusively on political dialogue, to hammer out agreement on the difficult issues that still lie ahead, including who will serve as prime minister in the run-up to elections. This will require statesmanship and compromise on all sides. We're paying particular attention to the financial dimension of the current situation. Efforts to steer state resources towards various militias in order to shore up political support on any side will be met with a sharp reaction. As we have all along, the United States believes only fair and inclusive national elections will restore legitimacy to those Libyan institutions charged with leading the country towards stability and prosperity. Now, some have questioned this total focus on elections, and I want to be clear. We do not see elections as an end in and of themselves, but they are the indispensable key to future progress. For without a strong unified government, Libya cannot bring its regions and ethnic groups together, share its wealth equitably, or rid the country of foreign fighters, mercenaries, or combat forces that challenge its sovereignty. I am confident Libya will be able to hold these elections. I believe just as with the October 2020 ceasefire, we will wake up one day and be pleasantly surprised at how quickly and smoothly this has come about. 
But this will not happen automatically, and we cannot let up in our determination to support the process. Looking ahead, I'm also optimistic about Libya's future. Even though we have not yet been able to reopen our embassy in Tripoli, we have had multiple opportunities to meet Libyan young people through exchange programs and engagements with the civil society in Tripoli and in Tunis. I've been tremendously impressed by how bright they are and by their commitment to taking their country into a better future. They have seen fighting and turmoil, electricity shortages and lines at the bank, and they have said enough. The United States will stand by these young people. We will stand by the parents who are so desperately trying to build a better future for their children. As we gradually reestablish our diplomatic presence on the ground, we will stand by all Libyans who want to put their country at last on a truly democratic path. As one young Libyan doctor once said to me, after more than 40 years of darkness, the Libyan people deserve to see the sun. Thanks, and uh, Sam, I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Ambassador. And um, I'm going to hand it over to Bill so that he can uh, moderate the rest of the session. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Issam. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for your highly informed and informative and um, encouraging remarks about uh, Libya going forward. And thank you, Issam, for your leadership on all things Libyan and American. Um, let me also say in the formula of one former ambassador uh, to Libya, US ambassador, um, elections can't solve Libya's problems. But in the words of another US diplomat who works on Libya, um, uh, Libya can't move forward without elections. Uh, and so it, it's, elections are a linchpin. They're critical, but they are not the whole solution. Um, today, we have a wonderful panel that has been already pre-introduced uh, by uh, Issam and uh, their full bios will be available on the Libyan American um, uh, uh, Alliance website. So without further ado, we're gonna move to the first panelist, Jonathan Weiner. I'm gonna give each panelist six to seven minutes and in the course of their remarks uh, prepared or otherwise, if they could say something about the last 10 years and about their take on the current situation, uh, that would be very useful. Uh, Jonathan, uh, just to remind you, is the former uh, US envoy for Libya and former Deputy Assistant Secretary, for Inter Secretary of State for International Law Enforcement, and is currently a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute and a writer on a number of uh, important international issues. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Lawrence. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Norland, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm actually very hopeful about this moment in Libya. After 10 years of seeing Libyans um, playing with and played with a variety of international actors, some of whom have been uh, destructive, we're seeing a period of time where the Libyan um, uh, political actors are starting to take initiative themselves. And uh, regardless of what winds up happening, between Mr. Debeba and Mr. Bashar, uh, to the extent that you have the High Council of State and the House of Representatives functioning cooperatively to make decisions on the formation of a government, well, that's what's supposed to have been happening uh, for the past um, six years and didn't. And now it seems to be happening. And if that is what happens, that's a very good development. Similarly, after seeing a series of governments East and West contesting one another, we have this odd situation where the two, two competing governments would both be headed by Ms. Rodden's. So it's not an East-West contest, which is a very good thing. Uh, potentially, it's a contest that can be resolved um, peacefully in inclusive fashion that enables a wide range of Libyans to feel that they are participating in the government and are being included within the uh, responsibilities of the government. These are political processes. They're not military processes fundamentally, though there is a security component. And so it is just possible that Libya's triad of political um, security and economic issues could all begin to get um, moved forward at the same time. And so I found when I wrote my most recent piece for the Middle East Institute, which was published um, three days ago, that I was unexpectedly hopeful 
by the competing government scenario in the third phase because of the possibility that the competition could be resolved um, politically uh, rather than through the use of force and could result in a negotiated um, a government which truly is interim rather than permanent. Uh, I know Fadi Bishaga has committed that if he uh, winds up as the person in charge, he's not, gonna, he's not going to just stay on, but is going to work to have elections facilitated through a constitutional process. If Libya is able to get through all of that, that's very good. And I wanna go back to a point that I just made because I think it's so important and so fundamental. The international, at least the United States, have been, ca have been calling for Libyan led processes for a long time. And for a long time, the only um, international events on Libya were held in Tunis, if it was gonna, going to be the near, 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 or maybe in Algiers, or in Rabat or, Rabat or Skorat or Cairo, or Abu Dhabi or Rome or Paris uh, or Geneva, or maybe Berlin. And to see the first event a year ago in which there was a Libya convened event, that was a very big deal. To see the HCS and the HOR working together potentially um, to support uh, a new government, that's also a, a big deal. My understanding is the House of Representatives actually held a vote and had an actual substantial majority. I've heard numbers of 137, 157, I'm not sure which is correct. But a lot of people, um, a lot of people to um, support this government. And uh, that's a, um, uh, a very, very big deal, uh, seeing that happen after a parliament which function fundamentally did not function for years. So for me, this is a hopeful uh, moment after a, a decade of trouble. And uh, I hope that we're going to be able to be in a position to celebrate it as we celebrated the idea of, of Libyans taking charge of their national lives rather than being on the receiving end for a self-proclaimed uh, dictator as things once were. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for your optimistic and incisive remarks. Our next speaker is Ali Abu Zakouk, um, who is a parliamentarian and former Libyan Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Government of National Salvation. Uh, he was also a longtime democracy activist here in Washington, D.C., and served as the um, president of the Citizen Forum, Citizenship Forum for Human Development and Democracy. Ali, I would ask you as well to unmute yourself and to, uh, in your six to seven minutes, say something about the last 10 years and your current take on the present. If, you're, if you've unmuted, we can't hear you. Do you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. I said I will uh, take uh, on the positive note uh, that uh, Jonathan just made. And I uh, will add to it and say that uh, the Libyans are hungry for democracy, hungry for civilian government, hungry for really stability. And the question will become always, how can the uh, Libyan people organize themselves despite the difficult actors who are playing in their role for their uh, personal uh, you know, agendas? Let me uh, in brief say that after the revolution of 17th of February, I would uh, say a word that for those who have given their lives for our freedom, for getting rid of the dictatorship, we uh, salute them in this anniversary and we promise them that we will uh, continue the struggle until Libya goes on the safe path to democracy and civilian government. After 19, uh, September 2011, I went to Libya from America and started to educate people about democracy. And for two years, I went from east to west to south, and I found there is a hunger for democracy, civil society, and training uh, that many people, young and old, uh, men and women, 
I did more than 60 workshops on active citizenship and uh, more than 200, 2,500 people uh, participated in them. Many of them participated in the elections of uh, the National Congress and then uh, for the parliament. And in 2014, I decided myself to run for the parliament uh, from Benghazi. And I was elected as a member and until today, I have not uh, uh, really uh, resigned because you don't resign parliamentarianship, but you all work on it. The question from the hope that uh, we, the people who believe in civilian government work with civil society and uh, with the help of the uh, uh, international actors, we found out that there is uh, some other actors who want really to influence the current events in Libya, be, be it by military, be it by other uh, you know, means. And that created uh, a situation for me as a parliamentarian, I cannot go to my city, Benghazi, because of the lack of security there. And uh, I stayed in Tripoli and Musrata because safety is there available. And at the same time, we uh, worked uh, with the parliamentarians in Tripoli when uh, the uh, renegade officer, Khalifa Haftar, tried to invade Tripoli. And we worked with a number of parliamentarians, about 100 of them, to really uh, defend the city and also to work against those who, are, who were supporting uh, the renegade officer to take Tripoli by force. Now we have a very good opportunity uh, for uh, turning the tide against those who are calling for a, burden, for a, a military government and turning the, the tide against all foreign mercenaries and foreign uh, troops uh, since the Geneva uh, meeting. I think uh, the country has moved step by step slowly, but surely, as uh, Mr. Beiba said, we don't want war anymore, which is a good sign for, uh, of, of hope that we will build uh, our country again. Now to the current events. The current events uh, are, uh, there are many flaws in them. The HOR did not follow even the internal, uh, you know, uh, quorum in their decision-making process, either when they put the uh, laws for the elections, which then did not work, or when they did now lately uh, voted for a government uh, in cooperation, namely, with uh, the High Council of State. Nevertheless, we are not having a perfect uh, political procedure there. And we work with a hope that despite all of these difficulties, we, the Libyan people, are looking forward to the future with having a free and fair elections as much as it could be because how can you have a free and fair elections with mercenaries around you, with military rule and security controlling the Eastern part of Libya and the Southern part of Libya and some of the Western part of Libya. Nevertheless, the Libyans are, they know all of these obstacles and they are still hoping for uh, a process that can make them that about 3 million people who are registered to vote can practice and uh, continue to elect their own representatives. And in brief, I can assure you and assure our audience that the Libyans' aspirations for a civilian government are very high. The Libyan aspirations for a free and fair elections are very high, and they will work to really bring about uh, something good for Libya. And as the old saying say, that in Libya there is something new always coming. So we hope that elections will soon come. I hope the, sol the solution between the Beiba government, the Geneva government, and the Tobruk uh, uh, assigned government, Bashaga, uh, can be solved. And the international actors have to play a good role, a good role to really bring a solution, a political solution for this crisis first, and to expedite 
the date for the elections as soon as possible because the Libyans in general are sick and tired of the HOR and the High Council of State and the temporary governments that have continued to live for the last 10 years. Thank you, Ali, for your hopeful and uh, well-informed comments. Our next speaker is Dr. Lamis Ben Saad, who's a political activist and a member of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum, uh, Forum and an assistant professor at the University of Tripoli. Uh, and uh, Dr. Uh, Lamis, if you also could say something about the last 10 years and the, also your read on the contemporary situation, and if you could unmute yourself. I'm seeing that she might not be here. Uh, so let's go to Hafid Guel. Uh, Hafid Guel is a non resident senior fellow at FIPRI. Getting feedback, and now I'm not. Um, he, he's also senior advisor at Oxford Analytica, and his full bio is on the website. Uh, Hafid, the same questions to you. I are muted. Everyone else getting feedback as well? Yeah, there was something there. Now it's better. Now it's gone. Now it's bad. Any, any, anytime half of the starts talking, there is this, 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 this uh, the feedback. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hafid, would you mind logging out and then? Okay, so we're going to ask him to log out and log back in. Um, can I ask Ben? Are you ready to go, Ben? Uh, I will try. Um, Thank you, Ben. So Ben uh, is uh, uh, as a senior fellow at the Washington Institute and member of the. Gedold Program on African Politics. He also served in the White House from 2009 to 2013 uh, as North Africa Director. Uh, ben, the floor is yours. Okay, hopefully my uh, audio is slightly better than uh, Halfords, but um, I'm uh, back in the office for the first time and uh, in a while, and the uh, computer system isn't working, so I'm going off of my laptop. Um, uh, we should all be so uh, lucky. Anyway, um, instead of addressing the immediate crisis, I'm gonna put a little bit into context in terms of where uh, we were in 2011. Um, and uh, um, this ongoing debate here about how Libya fits into the um, interventionist debate about um, whether the US should or can or would um, intervene in uh, such circumstances. Um, and um, I firmly believe uh, as someone who was at the White House from 2011 to 2013, it was the right thing to do in Libya, absolutely. Um, and uh, despite all that has happened uh, since, um, and these arguments about um, lumping it in with Afghanistan and Iraq just don't apply to Libya, I, I believe. Um, and I, I firmly believe that, and I've written about that and the differences um, among and between uh, the, the different contexts. Um, but uh, obviously we could have and um, should have done certain things um, differently, uh, including during the intervention, immediately after the intervention that ha could have um, stabilized uh, um, the country where we had a moment uh, of um, a pause in terms of leading up to the uh, 2012 elections. And obviously other, everything fell apart uh, for us in September, 2012, uh, uh, physically, uh, tragically and, and politically in, the, in this country. 
um, and then Ambassador New Orleans is, uh, suffer, suffers the consequences of that in terms of, uh, un unfortunately, the, you know, even the debate about having a physical presence in a country um, that he's uh, serving. Um, so um, we could have been more forceful um, and active in terms of leading the international community in a reconstruction effort. Um, but that is uh, irregardless of the fact that we should have been active in the inter inter intervention in 2011 and, uh, and uh, subsequently. Um, you know, Obama, uh, President Obama has famously remarked that Libya um, was his greatest mistake. If you read the quote more specifically, it's not he, he said not planning for the aftermath of Libya um, was the biggest mistake. Um, I have obviously, since I was part of that process, uh, thought long and hard about um, uh, his remarks and talked to people close to him about what he meant at the time, specifically because um, it referred to all of his presidency, not just Middle East, not just the uh, uh, foreign policy, but everything that he did. So it's a pretty damning remark. Um, and we can argue about what we did and what we, we think we did correctly and not, but um, we have to be self-critical about what we could have done differently in terms of being active on the ground. Um, but that's the reality of um, Libya. Uh, in U.S. foreign policy and U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. Um, that's why a group like the Alliance is so important because uh, it raises the profile um, of Libya in the U.S. Um, Libya, even in the midst of a kinetic war in 2011, was not the highest profile of the Obama administration. Um, even when we had aircraft uh, in the air, uh, um, you know, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, Iran, Egypt, the revolution, um, were taking more bandwidth um, in the White House uh, than Libya itself, um, other than that narrow month in April uh, of 2011. Um, and uh, Ambassador Norland knows this better than anyone getting the attention of Washington uh, on these issues. Um, is uh, of critical importance, um, especially when we're talking about um, getting our allies in line or um, not in line <laughs> or trying to um, uh, get our friends on the same page. Now, um, uh, to um, fast forward to where we, where we stand today, um, and others can uh, and have uh, and will make more comments on on uh, on the debate and what we sh can and should do. Um, it's great that we have a capable um, and effective voice on the ground in the UN right now. Um, but again, we can't take it for granted um, that um, Stephanie Williams is the only actor avail uh, available to break both sides of the debate and multiple, multiple sides of the debate. Um, and um, that's where we need to come into play as uh, a force of diplomacy, even in the midst of the Ukraine crisis and Russia. Um, and uh, we, we need to um, take advantage of um, our allies and uh, other partners uh, or um, sometimes uh, rivals to get these uh, parties together and, and make clear signals about how Libya has a, a real chance to go forward and instability is a, in, in the country is in no one's interest. Um, and then I want to close with um, sort of a response, uh, unfortunately, suggesting the opposite of what Ambassador Norland was um, uh, speaking about the enthusiasm of youth um, and um, uh, the 
uh, by quoting a, basically a, a just released um, paper from the Arab uh, Reform Initiative, suggesting that um, Libyans uh, are not only frustrated, but want to leave. And they've given up um, on the country, um, the political class, and um, they only see the prospects um, for uh, a better system um, for uh, leaving. So uh, let me just quote quickly from this and I'll, I can send around the link uh, in the chat. For youth today in Libya, the pervasive feeling is that they are not safe and cannot set deep roots for fear everything will collapse. Most view life outside of Libya as the only real option for the future. In other words, young people are seeking to build lives elsewhere. Um, now, the uh, flip side of this is obviously if there is an agreement, if there is a way forward, if there are elections that everybody hopes for and um, reinstituting some degree of legitimacy, um, that sense of despair can be reversed. Uh, and as uh, economic opportunities can, uh, which we all think should be um, there given the country's wealth. Um, but unfortunately that's uh, the sense of what I, uh, I see um, uh, on the ground. So sorry to end on uh, uh, more download than others, um, but I hope uh, sincerely uh, that for the sake of the country. And again, um, this is what I spend my time doing and uh, the Alliance is here for, to elevate Libya on the profile, the profile of um, American foreign policy. Um, and uh, we should all continue to do that as, as well. Thanks. Thank you, Ben, for your powerful thoughtful and characteristically I don't know who uh all right um so uh, for your uh, and characteristically self-deprecating remarks and I define the self here as the collective self I would I would add to what Ben said is I I participated in all five of the Libya working groups uh, in 2011 uh, and working with the, the World Bank and, and the other governments and the interagency and everything that went wrong in Libya, we prepared for. There was plenty of planning. I always felt that the problem was not in the planning, but in the implementation. Um, uh, I also was struck by that quote and would just add that um, that quote could speak for Tunisia right now and a number of countries in the region. And it's uh, um, uh, a powerful thing to think about uh, after we had so much promise after the Arab Spring. Um, could you uh, uh, let me know, Kareem, if you're ready to go next. Um, Kareem is director of the North Africa Initiative and resident senior fellow with the Rafiq Hariri Center and Middle East programs at the Atlanta Council uh, and a Libyan Italian scholar who we all depend on for his analysis on a regular basis. Kareem, if you could unmute yourself and address our two big questions of the day, the last 10 years, uh, and the contemporary situation, in addition to anything else you'd like to say. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much, Rubin. And thanks very much for the Libyan American Alliance for organizing this thing and for Ambassador Norland to join us. I, 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 to be, I tend to be optimistic in agreement with uh, Jonathan Weiner's first talk on the, on the short term. I think, I, I think that there, that there will be uh, an agreement between the two sides or whether that there will be a, a deal more than an agreement there will be uh, a way forward and uh, but i think we're going to go to much more of the same if you are lucky without without war without clashes but still on on a very bumpy road towards we don't know what with this continuous corruption increasing and work has not been done and uh, and, and then why, why, why I think that, 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 that is so is because the big problem at the basis of, of the Libyan civil war or the Libyan conflict have not been resolved. Going to election, and, and I was one of those who agreed with, with Stephanie Williams and, and we have said we have to go to election no matter what. The election will produce 
the only possible legitimate institution that then upon which we can work and uh, and, uh, and try to improve. But now I really, I really believe that, that, that we are not going to have fair and, and and inclusive elections. There there is no way. Not not in the short, not in the medium term. I don't see the possibility to have. Libya organizing an army, a police, a security force that will be national-wise neutral, that can guarantee that the ballot box in every single single place is not going to be taken by somebody's soldiers and change it with another ballot box. That the, 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 the bad things, Ambassador, that we know can happen over elections are not going to happen. I, I, I was wondering why we left not only not us as thinkers, but also the, 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 the diplomats responsible for it, the, the negotiators. We, we forgot that we should go back to 2011 and the issues that were there and the, what happened in 2012 and why we, we saw in 2012 the seeds of all the problems accumulated. That's because we went to an election that crystallized the differences, the differences in power. We thought that by having an election, the parliament would control the militias, and the, the opposite happened. We should have gone on in another different way, which is the way that could have brought a solution to all, or, or attempt to find a solution to all, to, 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 all, to, all, to, to, to all the problems, which is a national conference, a transnational, a transitional justice program a, a reconciliation issue something 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 like that something more basic than 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 a single election that that, that 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 cannot produce a result if we don't go back to that if we don't start thinking about that if we don't start thinking about asking the international community in in instead than for pushing for an election or for having their own proxies not to fight or to fight if, if, if we could create a system for which we, we could have this national conference where, where, where something was being prepared if you think about 2013 2014 there were people who were working on it and then it was abandoned entirely and it was not talked about again that could be probably the possibility to, 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 to create the foundations for the new state to create the foundation for for the new community they would solve the problems that are that are going to taint any any, any election or any result that come afterwards. Transitional justice is not being talked about. Do we do, do we think that the election can, can 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 bring peace to the Tarhuna, the families of the of, of the Tarhuna mass graves, or of, or, or of all that happened in Tripoli and the massacre that, that can happen, of all the of all the bad things that happen? Do we do we really think that if you go to an election, people will forget that people will will, will accept any result because of uh, of goodwill that, that will not happen that that will that, that will, will 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 require a much deeper effort i know much more difficult for for the for the diplomats but for the diplomacy because international diplomacy especially will have a hard time in dealing with this because it goes into values it goes into 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 into, into talking to different groups than the one that they officially have have to deal with but and I'm sorry if I'm too utopian or too the theoretical here. But I really think that the duty of us as scholars, as, as students of of the area, is to, is to try to to indicate possible solutions or opportunities to move or 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 improve. And 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 I don't feel in my heart valid to go up and say yes, let's go for elections or let's go for an agreement between two two two, two families, two governments. There will be a solution. There, there will be a way forward. It will be. A, a way forward until the next crisis, until the Libyans have decided what they want. If they, if they really seriously wanna, w w want to be together, if they really seriously want to force the militias to abandon the, the, the armed choice and agree on the peaceful resolution of, of, of every conflict, if they want that has to come by, by, by bonding of the various groups and the, and the decision, the, 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 the effective national conciliation it, institution or or effort can bring about thank you thank you kareem for your optimistic 
but also idealistic comments, which therefore make them somewhat pessimistic, but realistic. <laughs> so thank you for that, uh, those, those important comments. I'd like to run a quick test and see if Hafid's- uh, uh, I'm going to ask the, to mute um, Hafid. I'm so sorry, Hafid. Uh, uh, it's just not working today at this point. Um, I'd like to just turn uh, briefly to Ambassador Norland and ask him if he has any reflections on what the panelist has said to this point, and then we're going to open it up for the questions. Yeah, thanks, Bill. And, and um, I, I, a number of, of uh, thoughts were, were triggered by the really good comments that everybody made, um, uh, and I'll just run through them kind of randomly. Um, I mean, first of all, when we Think about um, the the victims of of what happened um, uh, after in the course of and following the Libyan revolution. Um, it, it is good that we think and just pause for a second to remember Chris Stevens, uh, Glenn Doherty, Sean Smith, and Tyrone Woods. Thanks for for just uh, remembering our, our colleagues. Um, uh, there was a, a comment I think from Ben about um, remembering the the diplomatic role of. Uh, of helping to sort of shepherd allies and partners in this process. And, and I think there's really a remarkable degree of alignment right now in the international community behind the, the basic trend of what's going on. Um, there are some who would like to kind of speed things up. There are some who are ready to kind of jump in with both feet on one side of the process before others. But, you know, I, I think um, when you look at some of the dynamics between Turkey, Egypt, uh, the Emiratis, we're in a different place than we were you know, a year or two ago. Um, uh, also on Ben's point about, you know, the, the, the feelings of the number of the youth. I mean, uh, you, you definitely need to take into account that any, any perspective we offer is colored by the fact we're not on the ground. And, uh, you know, we won't be for a while. So what we see is a bit of a cross section, but it is of, of incredibly bright and talented young people who wanna go study in the US or elsewhere and then go back and, and do good things. and. Um, it's quite inspiring every time you, you run across them, uh, even if it is maybe a, a limited cross section. Um, uh, let's see here. Oh, on the, on the profile of, of, the, of uh, Libya in American foreign policy, um, I think uh, you know this, this kind of event helps to remind people that um, even though uh, Libya is not at the top of the of the agenda, even in the Middle East, uh, you know it is one of those areas where the United States can make a difference, and I, I think this event is really useful in that regard. Um, and then, just finally, on the point about uh, reconciliation, um, uh, I think it's a really important point, uh, and I've been struck in some of uh, Stephanie's comments of late after coming back and making the rounds of all the, the political actors over the last several weeks. And she's really striking this theme about the need for reconciliation, that, that there are um, the point about the need to get at the fundamentals here and figure out ways to bridge, uh, bridge the gaps is very real. I had a chance a, a couple of weeks ago to take part in a, a kind of an interesting event that USAID was supporting through the American Bar Association. And it was a mediation effort involving uh, uh, Ahali and, uh, and Tebu tribes in the south that had um, uh, basically, you know, fallen apart over uh, uh, in the course of, of the Haftar offensive. Uh, some had taken one side, some another. People were killed, houses were taken. And this was an effort to broker uh, kind of a reconciliation between them that seems to be going uh, surprisingly well. And, and, you know, we've tried to make the point this is an example that could be applied nationwide. Uh, but I, I think the point about the need to uh, pursue that track uh, and not just treat it as a kind of rhetorical nice thing to do is really uh, very valid. Um, I'll pause there. Thanks. Uh, Ambassador Norland, we have a lot of questions, but I was wondering if I could ask just three of them in very telegraphic form to you uh, and if you could address them. Uh, the first one, and we got this six or seven times, is could you say anything about Libyans and H2 uh, a and B visas, just the general situation of visas for Libyans, if you have any comments on that. Uh, number two, um, if you could say anything about the constitution and constitutional basis for elections, I know you touched on that somewhat, but if you could go a little further. Uh, and um, also, what can Libyan Americans do, in your opinion, to help out with all of the things that we're discussing today? 
Yeah, on, on visas, um, you know, I, I guess um, from where I sit, uh, I'm not seeing or I'm not a lot of, of sort of controversial cases are being brought to my attention or people yelling and screaming because they were uh, denied a visa. We are processing visas for people to come to the United States on exchange programs for meetings with U.S. officials. Um, you know, if you're hearing of, of situations where Libyans who, who feel they've been unfairly uh, treated on the visa front, please let me know. I, uh, I, I mean, there are always going to be those cases where uh, you have a situation, you know, based on U.S. visa law, where uh, if somebody is considered a, a possible immigrant uh, risk and then not really intending to come back to Libya, then uh, the vice consul has has absolute authority to deny that visa. But that's are, true are, worldwide. That's not just are regarding Libya Libya. specifically excluded from H two A and two B the work visas. I'll have to take that question uh, and yeah. and get back to you, Bill. Okay. Uh, if you want to send it to me, maybe You're in up. an email. I, I want I want to be sure I get it right. Um, okay. H two A and and B, I think, is what you said. Um, and it's been so long since I did consular work, I, I don't even remember which ones those are. The work visas, but go ahead. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah. Um, on the constitutional basis issue, um, uh, you know, I think that um, a couple of important things. One is, as was alluded to in in somebody's remarks, um, you know, there there is for the first time in a long time some. A modicum of uh, consensus between the, the state council and the HOR uh, on a process to address uh, the constitution as part of the electoral process. And I think one of the points Stephanie makes, and, and we agree completely, you want to focus on a basis uh, with the idea that the actual full-fledged constitution would be approved after a new parliament is in place. You need something to get you through elections uh, trying to make the perfect the enemy of the good is, is not going to work. Um, and, and the people we talk to generally tend to favor the idea of, of reaching agreement on some fundamentals that can serve as a basis. Um, you know, there are those who in the past have, have tried to cite the Constitution as a, an absolute imperative before you can have elections have tended to be the people who don't want to have elections. And so we don't think that the Constitution should be used as a as a block, um, and, and the focus should be on a on a realistic basis. Um, and and uh, there has been some interesting movement between the two key institutions on that front, although they are not out of the woods yet by any stretch of the imagination. On um, on what Libyan Americans can do, I mean things like this, where bringing to the public's attention um, the the fact that uh, that uh, you know there there is both opportunity and risk uh, still underway in Libya. Uh, the engagement with the Hill in support of, of uh, both uh, the, the Libya Stabilization Act and something called the, uh, uh, the uh, what's it called, uh, Global Fragility Act, uh, which may end up having some relevance for Libya. Um, uh, you know, I think that kind of engagement is all to the good. Uh, you know, it's not that Libya needs huge resources, but uh, it does need attention, uh, focused attention from time to time. And uh, that kind of engagement, I think, can uh, can really do some good. As a start, I'd, I'd leave it there. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, we have another six or seven questions that you know, I'm not going to read them all. Some of them are quite complex. But the sort of center of gravity of a number of these questions is, could you say something about you know, East and West making up under the Bashaga Aguila Salah deal? You know, your views on the parliament? Have you attended a session of parliament? Uh, when you travel to the East, you know, do you try to make that a priority? How often do you do it? There's a number of questions in that vein. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, Bashaga uh, has apparently been able to do something that, uh, you know, the Bible was not able to do, which was reach some sort of understanding that would start to bring the East and West together. Now, we'll see whether that's real, whether it holds up. And I don't blame the Baiba alone for not being able to produce that. Um, but you know, the the fact is that what people are looking for is some effort to reunify the country politically. The the fact that you've been able to open the coastal road and, and physically begin to unite the country is really important. Uh, that you have uh, flights now going from Matiga to uh, Benina uh, is really important. Uh, but the political dimension of it yet still has to be resolved. Um, uh, 
parliament's a really interesting institution. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, in large, uh, to, to a large degree discredited. Uh, there have been numerous references in the comments about uh, disaffection with the political class. And, and I think that's very true, but it is still one of the institutions that's out there to deal with. And um, I have only been to the parliament Tobruk once when they, um, um, inaugurated the, the new uh, government, the, the interim government of national unity uh, in March of last year, um, we've tended to do our, we're, we're, we're about at the stage of a one trip a month uh, into Libya and they've tended to focus on Tripoli. Um, I had planned to go to, um, to Benghazi um, last month or yeah, in January, uh, sorry, it was in, in February, it was gonna be uh, in fact for meetings on about the 8th. And then all this drama started to unfold with the House of Representatives. And we realized if, if we went there, we would, you know, A, the, the parliamentarians we wanted to meet were gonna be busy and couldn't come and see us. And B, you know, we would very easily be uh, tagged with kind of playing games or interfering or whatever. So that trip got pulled down. But uh, I would like to get back to the East, uh, uh, if not the next trip, then the one after. It's, uh, it's um, you know, the, the dynamics of, of one part of the country still feeling left out um, are, are very real. Um, and, and let's not forget the South, which is uh, the most uh, left out of any of the regions in Libya. Uh, let me also just ask a question um, uh, that a lot of people have been asking, but, but not exactly the way it's asked in the chat. I'm gonna reframe it a little bit. How, Stephanie Williams is American. You're American, right? She's an ex-U.S. diplomat and a senior official at the U.S. Embassy. How does it work between the U.S. mission and between the U.N., which has an American diplomat as the senior advisor? And, uh, you know, by extension to that, um, do, do you coordinate closely on having a common position? And by extension to that, there are a number of questions here about is the U.S. really neutral? You know, did the U.S. stop the elections for this reason or that? So if you could talk just about the American neutrality and also how we come up with that common position with the U.N. Well, um, the idea that we would want to stop the elections is, is um, nuts. <laughs> and uh, we were as disappointed as anybody that they uh, didn't uh, follow, you know, didn't take place. Um, you know, uh, to be a UN official um, uh, is is a you know a special kind of role because you 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 don't have one client. That, well, in a sense, her client, her main client, is the Secretary General of the UN and the Security Council. But you you know, even the Security Council, you've got fifteen clients, and then you've got the whole you know UN. You're neutral, um, and uh, we, uh, of course, have to. Uh, we're we're lucky that we, you know, going back to uh, Hassan Salame and then uh, Stephanie, the the leadership of Unsbill has been uh, so capable. And uh, for all the the frustrations that they've run into, uh, and that uh, some people have expressed one way or another, um, you know, and even with Jan Kubish, who got a lot of criticism, and some of it was unfair. Um, you know, uh, our job is to respect the role of the of the UN uh, special uh, representative or special envoy or special advisor. Uh, if we have a particular point of view, then of course we want to convey it and, and try to shape the the uh, posture of the UN. But uh, our ba we basically have found that the that the UN's approach uh, is the right one, and we want to support it and and help uh, gain buy-in to it, um, both from other international partners and from Libyan uh, partners. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, I was once on a, a, a at the time, CSCE, now OSCE uh, peacekeeping mission, uh, and I was an American diplomat seconded to that group. Um, I had different points of view than the American ambassador in Georgia. Uh, and, you know, we, we had to figure out, you know, how to, how to work that. I, I'd say in this case here, there's a great deal of alignment, uh, coincidentally, uh, between UNSMIL and, and the U.S. Embassy, and, and we're happy that it's working out that way. But I, as I said earlier, there's also, a, you know, a large degree of international alignment between what UNSMIL is trying to do. And Stephanie does a great job. She did just the other day a, a briefing. There were probably 70 diplomats on a Zoom call like this uh, from that many different countries tracking what's going on. Uh, hearing the unsmill approach, and if they have comments and, and suggestions on how to do it better, they they offer them. Uh, and then she she does talk to to uh, individual groups of diplomats, 
uh, to try to keep people informed on, on what they might do that really could help the mission do its job. And I understand from the Libyan press, she's speaking tomorrow for the UN. I don't know exactly where. Um, uh, let me um, ask you another question. Uh, you began to speak about this, but could you say a little bit more about um, the electoral law, um, the vetting of candidates, especially controversial candidates, and any other comments you have about the electoral law, for example, the division of labor between the parliament and the presidency, do we have a view on that? You know, uh, do we have a view on the process to getting towards revisions of the electoral law? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I guess the way to talk about it is, you know, before December 24th and after December 24th, um, you know, the electoral law before December 24th was, was controversial. Um, uh, but as I was saying in my remarks, it really was controversial because of who it allowed to be a candidate or didn't allow to be a candidate. And, um, you know, the, there was a sense that, uh, that the HOR rammed through an electoral law. Um, Jan Kubisch uh, took the view that uh, it was not for the international community to, to dispute the HOR's uh, ability to pass that kind of a law, but rather let's work with it and, and try to just keep things moving forward. Uh, in the end, um, the issue of controversial candidates, particularly Saif, you know, brought everything to a grinding halt. So in, in a sense, the issue isn't just the law, but how it's implemented and, and the the mechanism for judging, you know, whether candidates met the criteria in the law or not, was uh, were elements of the judiciary, and uh, you know, because of threats or um, uh, bias or whatever, or or bribes, uh, all kinds of accusations have been made. Um, the 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 judgments that you needed to produce a final list of candidates were, could not be made. Uh, so before December twenty fourth, that that process broke down. Uh, now we're in a new phase of trying to revisit the electoral law as part of what the HOR and the state council are agreeing on. Um, you know, that there will be an effort to define a new law. Uh, it will still have to grapple with these issues fundamentally. Um, and, and the issue of, of how do you, if, if you're going to have the judiciary be the uh, implementer, or the arbiter, uh, how do you uh, protect and empower the judiciary to be able to make these decisions without being intimidated? So that it's a part of the process that still is going to require a lot of work. Um, Imad al Saya uh, is, is a, a, an instrumental part of that, um, along with the whole process of registering voters. Uh, that's, of course, part of the electoral process as well. And I guess there's some sense that at a certain stage here that the registrations may have to be renewed. Um, you know, on a, on a, a private personal note, uh, there, you know, poor Imad uh, suffered a, a, a loss uh, recently with the death of his wife due to COVID. And uh, so a guy who, who's got a huge responsibility and who's done a, a remarkable job is now facing an additional uh, personal uh, tragedy. Um, let's talk for a minute about something that came up during the panel, but hasn't necessarily been talked about much in the questions, which is, you know, did the HOR have a quorum or not? Did the HOR have a vote or not? You know, were, was the other candidate or other candidates barred from presenting themselves for Bashaga's job? You know, is the, does the HOR have power now? You mentioned them as just one of a constellation of players. Obviously, the LPDF is not around and not coming back, which led to um, uh, Debeba's nomination and election by the 75. But if you could just talk a little bit about how you view um, what the HOR is, what the HOR did, and, and mm -hmm. HOR all going forward. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, here again, we're very much guided by Ansmil's. Uh, interpretation of all this because they they've got people you know looking carefully at the process reviewing film uh footage of the voting how things were handled uh people who speak you know fluent arabic and, and understand what's going on uh there's an element of this that has to do and, and which has been positive and and new uh which is the the consensus uh, fragile consensus between the state council and the hor on, on the process so that's an important part of all this uh you know, going back to the Libyan political agreement, um, having some form of consensus between those two institutions was key. And until recently, you haven't seen it. Now, you know, even after it was achieved for purposes of this vote, there have been some questions about is the state council second guessing itself? Is it second guessing Mishri? Will it hold? But for, you know, for purposes of what happened on February 10th, uh, there's the feeling that, that the, the, the consensus criterion was met. In terms of the quorum, uh, again, from Unsmill's review of, of film footage and so forth, 
it seems pretty clear that there was a there were more than an, you know almost 140 uh, MPs there. I think you only needed 120. Um, there was a question about why Aguila didn't call a roll call vote, why it was just a show of hands. Um, you know, Unsmill's view is that the, uh, the there was a decisive um, vote in favor of uh, Bashaga. Uh, we've heard subsequently one reason that it was not a, a, a roll call vote was because the other guy, uh, a lot of his supporters uh, didn't want to be recorded as uh, voting against uh, Bashaga. Uh, and so he, he had a very small number of, of supporters. Uh, it was better for those to be involved in the show of hands rather than uh, having been recorded against Bashaga, which, you know, maybe they felt would be held against them later. So, you know, by, as, as Stephanie's the first to say, you know, uh, it, things get messy uh, in, in this context. But um, by, by the standards that have been applied, uh, our sense is that what transpired on the 10th has validity. The issue now is the, the issue now is will will there be validity to the process of, of a vote of confidence in, in a Bashaga government if one is put forward? Uh, Bashaga is apparently still trying to identify a cabinet, uh, possibly put it to a vote in the HOR as early as next week. Um, we're told there will be a roll call for that vote. Um, th this will be a test of the process and of the institution. I'd like to thank you, uh, Ambassador, for staying on past the amount of time we requested and taking all these questions. And I'd like to hand things back to Dr. Uh, Umesh. Uh, thank you, Bill, very much. Thanks to all of the panelists and thanks, uh, thanks to the audience. And above all, thanks to uh, Ambassador Norland for taking the time. I know it's probably your dinner time and you've had a long day, but we really appreciate you very much. And we appreciate uh, everybody who made this event possible. We still continue to pray and stay steadfast on this path of democracy and stability for Libya. And we appreciate everybody who's lending a hand along the way. So thanks again, Ambassador. Good night. And thank You're you welcome. all very Have much. a good thank rest you, of the day. And, and, uh, thanks to the, the Alliance for putting this on. And thank you, Bill. Thank you thank very you. much. God bless you. Thank you.